what if you had all the skills you need right now to make any amount of money you want? What if you were not lacking in your abilities and it was only a matter of alignment of what you do with someone who would benefit and and uh, receive value from the work that you do. It's not that your art is inherently valueless. It's that to the right person, it's invaluable. It's tremendously beneficial to them. I study the patterns of the universe. The the brain. Virtual, virtual, virtual mind. Talking about your life, fundamental principles, philosophy. What is and what is not true? Those who know themselves. Being better every single day. Today I am speaking with Sean McCabe. Sean is someone who I've known for a few years now, and this guy is an online wizard, basically. Sean is um, an extremely disciplined and organized person, and I wanted to pick his brain about how he goes about creating systems for his business and his life. Um, a few a few things about Sean here. He's the author of Overlap, which is a book that helps you transition from working a day job to focusing on your passion or your business. And his company, Sean West, kind of has the same mission. Overall, just to help you find clarity, get unstuck, and start your business. You know, make a sustainable living from from your passion. And so he's very, very good at doing that. He's done that in different niches several times and has helped many others do the same. When he first started out, he was really into hand lettering, you know, the like fancy letters that people draw with these elaborate pens. You may have seen them on Instagram, but Sean was one of those guys. He made half a million dollars doing hand lettering. And so I asked him about that um, and, and some of his other projects. He is a very clear thinker, very smart guy, and a very good teacher. So I learned a lot from him. I'm actually going to have to listen to this episode a couple of times to really get some of the details as I think you you might want to do as well. But um, something else that's interesting about Sean is that he writes a million words per year. He, again, is super disciplined and very intentional, very thoughtful. So this is something that he really set out to do. And I asked him about, about this, why he does it and, and how he does it. Because I, as a fellow writer, really am interested in, in those numbers. That's a huge, that's a huge deal. If you are someone who is wanting to start an online business or maybe you've already started one and kind of don't know where to go or what the next steps are, highly recommend listening to this podcast. You will get a lot out of it. Sean offers a lot of practical and actionable steps for the newbie and also for the advanced person who's kind of, or the intermediate, who's just kind of coasting and and wants to grow their business. Anyway, Hope you like it. Let me know what you think. Check out Sean on Instagram. He's at Sean West, S-E-A-N-W-E-S. And let me know what you think about this episode. Here is Sean McCabe. Sean, what's up? How are you? Hey, Ruben. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you for thank you for coming on. Um, I've been following you online for some time and been wanting to ask you a bunch of questions because you seem like a super like disciplined and also very highly organized person who is kind of in the same space as I am. I'm I'm organized in some ways, but but other ways not. So anyway, I hope we can unpack some of that. First of all, like just to give people an idea of what it is that you do and kind of your background, um, what is it that you do and what is your background? Yeah. So I guess what I do right now is do you know someone who's in a day job that's sucking their soul away? Mm, yep. I help people in that situation start a business doing something that they actually love doing so they can create financial freedom and enjoy life again. But I, I realize that's not something where you can just take a leap and hope that it works out. Some people can afford to make a risk like that, but others of us need something a little more practical because we have families and rent to pay. And so, you know, it's helping people navigate that transition. It's less of a leap and more of a transition. So that's kind of what I do now and in various forms, whether it's through our online community or podcasts or videos or in-person conference. Uh, That's, that's what my, 
my situation looks like today, but uh, how far back should I go to give the backstory? Well, what the, the day and hour you were born, maybe that would be... <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. All the way um, back. <laughs> let's do, um, let's do, well, I mean, I think that's an interesting entry point. Maybe when you were transitioning um, away from your job and, and kind of moving into the, the space that you're in now. Oh, yeah, perfect. Because uh, if we went all the way back, I'd say, well, uh, I'm the oldest of 13 kids. But when I was what? born, obviously. Is that a real thing? There weren't 13. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's shocking and amazing. Incredible. Okay, cool. Never, that's a good never start. Never a dull moment growing up, <laughs> that's for sure. But man, I am an introvert through and through, and I love my space and my silence and my beanbag. You know, I just give, give me that time to just sit and think. Like, I, I love it. That's how I recharge. And so it's really weird for someone like me to put himself out there in the form of speaking or podcast or video like it's it's literally the last place that it, it's so far outside of my element so why do i do it how did i get to that point um well going back i i'm definitely a creative person and it's you know i'm really logical i'm really objective about things but i also have this creative side to me and i've found that where wherever those two in, intersect is where I've found that I'm passionate about things. So that could be music. You know, you have you have somewhat of a, a set of rules or at least guidelines of the underlying chord structure if you want something to sound good anyway. But within that structure, you can be you can be creative. You can be you know, there's so much freedom within that structure. And so you know, going back to um, high school, like end of high school, I was in a a band, and you know, we we're playing. We we're actually full time for a little bit touring around. Um, and that was great until the revenue part of being in the band wasn't full time. So we were calling ourselves full time, but we didn't really have enough money coming in. And that's kind of what got me into entrepreneurship. We all decided, you know what, we need to find other ways to supplement our income. And we each started our own different businesses to do that. And if you fast forward a little bit, I got married uh, a few years after and decided, you know, this band thing, like it's really fun, but I think I need to get a little bit more serious about the business that I'm running, which at the time was computer repair and, you know, be able to support my wife and pay bills and get food on the table and that kind of thing. So I stepped down from the band, but what I didn't anticipate was this creative void that was going to be left in my life. It, now it was all just you know, tech stuff, which I enjoy, but I, I like being creative. And so it kind of it started to evolve. And, and um, people who were my clients, I uh, had a lot of business clients, a lot of residential clients. I'm fixing their computers and their networks. And they're saying, do you do websites as well? Can you design a website? And I said, sure. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I decided to figure it out on the job and got into design and really enjoyed the creative element of design and that that part you you can kind of tell that I enjoyed it more because that part started to flourish even more and I I was getting a bunch of client work to the point where I, I was having to turn down work because I didn't have enough capacity so I, I was like okay I'm gonna bring on a partner partner I knew this friend who was a developer at a local firm and he wasn't getting paid well but he was really smart and so we started this web design firm together and started building websites and like that's kind of how I got into you know, running a business, creating content, working with clients, doing creative stuff online, and bridging the gap from there to where I am now. I've I've always had this, I call it an overlap. You know, that's the the title of my book is Overlap. And the idea is you've got the thing paying your bills. It's kind of like your your income foundation. But then often, at least for me, there's this thing on the side that is this itch, you know, that you want to scratch, this thing that you're actually passionate about that you want to do but the problem is it doesn't pay your bills it it's not it's not actually bringing in that money and for me of all things it was hand lettering just doing custom hand drawn letters on the side in my nights and weekends like back in the day i wasn't watching netflix i wasn't playing video games i wasn't going out with friends i would literally just sit and draw for for like 6 hours every day outside of the day job you know outside of the web firm work i was just 
drawing, like, cause I loved doing it. And I, I you know, I was like, what, what am I even doing here? This can't be a job. And I don't know where I'd heard that message before, but it was like, if you're going to do something, it needs to be something that you can make money from. Like, I guess that's kind of a, a, a common message. And I was like, I can't make money from hand lettering, but little did I know that I would go on to make somewhere around half a million dollars from hand lettering years later. Wow. That's amazing. How, how, how did that come about? Did you start teaching people how to hand letter? Was it kind of a, a course type of a thing? So I was just creating and I decided to share what I was making. I was drawing every day and I would post it online, places like Instagram. And the thing is, Ruben, no one really noticed for two years. No one really cared. But I wasn't doing it for any kind of recognition. I really just genuinely loved it. And that's why I kept doing it. I just kept showing up every day for two years. And then something happened right around the two-year mark. People started noticing. And they were saying, hey, I really like that piece that you did. Uh, do you have prints? Can I buy a poster or a t-shirt? And some other clients would say, well, they weren't clients yet, but they were saying, hey, I like your lettering. Could you make a logo for us? And I was like, sure. And I already had my bills covered with the web firm work. And so any money that I made from hand lettering with clients was extra. It was just a bonus. And so I took that money from the client work and I invested it in a run of t-shirts. So it was maybe like a thousand dollars or something like that to get enough t-shirts made. And I posted that I, Hey, Hey, you know, this design that you liked, I've got a t-shirt and then the shirt sold out and I reprinted it and it sold out again. And it happened five or six times. <laughs> so I've got this like side thing that's starting to pick up traction. But again, it was only after doing this every day for two years that people even started to care. And, you know, my, my business partner, he ended up taking another job and we hibernated the firm. And I'm like, well, I could either try and get another job or I could take this lettering thing full time. Like it seems to be doing well. And so I, I just went all in on that. Just started doing more client work, got to the point where I was working with some big names, you know, like the city of Las Vegas for a business to business ad campaign or Rachel Ray magazine. And I was, I was making like, I was charging five figure rates on these projects. Like I'd learned, I, I was reading books about licensing and stuff and learned that a lot of artists, like in my case, I'd already worked in business before I got into art. And so I was kind of able to utilize that knowledge where I, w I didn't have to be a starving artist because I knew the selling power of my work and I was able to charge accordingly. And so I'm just kind of going along, you know, like things are going really well by this point, you know, several years in, I was actually making um, around $100,000 just as a hand lettering freelance artist, like just working with clients. What were some of the kinds of projects that you did? So uh, the, the more expensive ones, like the, the most expensive I got to finally was uh, charging $8,000 for a logo. And I thought, this is the pinnacle. Like, I've made it. This is incredible. You know, like, this is so good. And, and the company that was in, uh, you know, Silicon Valley kind of company, I, I learned from a friend who had a friend that worked there that they thought I was cheap. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like someone else was telling them like, oh yeah, we paid 25 for ours. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I, I have um, charged, you know, like we work with sponsors on, on Finger of Prosper sometimes and well, like charge a, an aggressive price, what I feel is like at the limit of, of what I can say with a straight face, you know, and then I'll like be talking with a friend who does it kind of, is kind of in the same niche and he'll be like, Oh yeah, we charge like double that. Like you're undercharging. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Oh my gosh. It's like Gary V talks about his early speaking engagements, you know, like people come to him and they're like, Hey, you know, will you do a speaking engagement? And he's like, yeah, uh, $5,000. They're like, great done. And he's like, Oh, I should have charged more. And so he thinks up this clever story and he goes, uh, he's like, they come back and they're like, okay, so you're going to speak for an hour. And then, and he goes, oh no, no, no. I thought it's, I normally do 30 minutes. So if it's going to be an hour, it's going to be $10,000 and they go, okay, done. And he was like, no, I should have charged more. <laughs> that's a good one. But see that that's a, also a good point in terms of like negotiating when you're on the other side of the negotiation, like accepting the offer, you don't want to accept it too easily. You want to be like, 
Uh, that's a, well, I guess, I guess we can do that. Sure, go ahead, you know, as opposed to like, oh yeah, sure, that's fine. Because then you leave the other person thinking, oh damn, I could have charged more. Cause he didn't even, he didn't even give any resistance, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I, so I'm thinking like, dude, I'm doing, I'm doing great here. And I, of course I was like, I was, I, I'm still young. I'm 30 years old, but like I, I was early twenties at this point and making great money and finding out, wow, like people actually charge even more than this. You know, it's all like, this is a whole other topic in and of itself that I've been thinking about lately, but I really believe it's about alignment alignment of your skills and your services with people who can value them the greatest amount from what you do and they're out there but you know we're we're so desperate we're so desperate to take on any job we can get we take on all these lowball clients you know and what if like just i'm just going to float this idea out there what if you had all the skills you need right now to make any amount of money you want what if you were not lacking in your abilities and it was only a matter of alignment of what you do with someone who would benefit and and uh receive value from the work that you do because if you think about it like big companies you know when, when they get a logo they're thinking about how much it's going to make them at scale or you know they do a advertising campaign you know and they're putting millions of dollars in this but they're going to get millions of dollars out it's it's not that your art is inherently valueless it's that to the right person, it's invaluable. It's tremendously beneficial to them. That's a super important point. It's like proper alignment is the key. What, how do you do that? Like, how do you make sure that you kind of leverage your talents in the right way? <laughs> this is a big mindset shift. So the first thing is belief. You have to believe that the right clients are out there. There are good clients. And there are bad clients. And a lot of people think those are the only two kinds of clients. But I submit to you that there is a third group of clients, great clients. And by definition, they are the exception. If they were the norm, they would be average. They would be good. But they are, they are great clients. You know, like for instance, with my book, Overlap, I hired an editor. I stalked this guy for six months. I found a guest post of his that was amazing. He talked about editing. He wrote about editing. And the thing that I noticed was that he responded on this guest post to every single comment. I was like, this guy's good. I'm going to subscribe to his newsletter. And he was putting out these valuable newsletters. And so six months in to him, not even knowing that I exist, I reach out to him and I say, hey, I want you to edit my book. And we go through the process. And, he, you know, he said, I wrote the best client proposal ever. He's like, I can't wait to work on this project. He charged me a price. I paid him 40% more than what he quoted me. When is the last time your client voluntarily paid you 40% more than you quoted them? And here's why I did it. <laughs> I'm looking at this guy. I'm watching him for six months. I'm like, this is the guy. He's going to help take my book from good to great. And I told him that. I said, I want you. I said, I know my book is good. I want this book to be great. And here's what I, I don't want. I don't want you to just take what I've written and edit it and we ship this out. I said, I want you to help me take this book from good to great, whatever that looks like. And I want to pay you more so that you feel like you have the freedom to do that. And so he helped me basically dissect the whole thing and rearrange it. What an editor can do is edit what you've given them. They can't add more to your book. That That's something to remember. And I was omitting things. I was like, ah, I don't need this, don't need that. And, and I realized later, and for, I was very fortunate in uh, having him bring this up. He was like, we need some more of this. And I was like, well, actually, I wrote that and I didn't even give it to you. And he's like, yeah, give me that. We're going to work this in. And so that is what's possible. Like people like me, I used, to be, I used to be the freelancer. I was doing the work for seven years. I was the one who was getting hired. Now I'm the person who I've written the five-figure checks. I'm hiring people. And so I know what things are like from both sides. I finally, you know, years later, understand the mindset of the business person who's actually writing the checks. And, and you who are doing the work, you know, you're the service provider. You often don't understand the mindset of the business owner. They already know the value of the result of the work you do. I already knew the value of the result of his editing with my vision for this book. 
And so the first step is belief. You have to believe that great clients are out there. And the beautiful thing about that is you don't need many great clients. You're like, Sean, there's not that many great people like that out there. I agree with you. The good news is you don't need that many because great clients, they're they're not only going to pay well, they're not only going to let you do your work and not micromanage, but they're going to want to work with you again and again and recommend you to more great clients. Yeah, yeah. These are kind of like the uh, the clients that Tim Ferriss was talking about in the 4-Hour Workweek where he was like, you know, you have to 80-20 your clients. W- what are the 20% of clients that are causing 80% of your headaches, you know? Mm. And so I think that's a, that's a super useful framework. But it's, So it starts with belief, but it's not only belief. You have to say no, not only to the bad clients, but get this. You need to say no to the good clients. If you want great clients, you need to say no to all the opportunities to work with people who are not great clients. And how in the world can you do that when you're in scarcity mindset, when you're desperate for money, when you need that quick cash to pay the bills? You can't do it. And that's where the overlap comes in. You've got, you've got to have, a, I, I call it the day job, you got to have something that covers your bills 100% while you build this thing on the side so that you don't get into scarcity mindset, so that you can, you can pass on the opportunities that you know will be bad for you, so that you can build this thing up into something that you actually love to do and not just create another job for yourself. So number one thing is having, having a good foundation, a good financial, good financial stability so that you can have the freedom to pursue what it is that you're doing on the side in, in a way that's comfortable and in, 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 in a way that will actually help you progress. Yes, the day job is the foundation. And it's okay if it's not something you love. That's fine. The day job isn't the place for your passion. You know, it just, it needs to be something you don't hate. If you currently hate your day job, quit. Get another day job. I'm not saying quit and go pursue your passion. It'll all work out. It's not that simple. Get a day job you don't hate. And here's the litmus test. Here's how you know, because I, I recommend that your day job be in a different industry than that of your passion. And, and so people say, well, how close is too close? Here's the litmus test. Do you come home from your day job depleted of all energy? You want to collapse on the couch. You want to watch Netflix. You have no energy for pursuing your passion. Or do you come home from the day job charged up, excited, ready to go, ready to work on your side project? That is how you know. And for the people who are in the the wrong day job, they're in a bad day job, you know, a bad boss, bad environment, negativity. This is this is so huge because it's like you don't even believe such a thing exists. You get to such a point of demoralization that you believe work is supposed to be a drudgery. I'm supposed to be drained. Like this is the life that I've resigned to. It doesn't have to be that way. Find a day job that you don't hate that covers your bills so that you come home energized to work on your side passion. Yeah, that's a useful way to look at it. So when you first started doing the thing that you were obsessed about, which by the way, like let's take hand lettering. That, that was a really funny thing. You like would just hole up in your room, I assume, for a long time and and do the hand lettering for hours on end, which I totally relate to because you seem, and, and I think I'm correct in this, but you seem like kind of an obsessive person. Um, and I am definitely an obsessive person also. So like when I was young, you you know, I've had different phases throughout my life. Like I had my, my magic phase. I was super into not the card game, but the, um, (laughs) like actually doing magic tricks, um, with like, like card tricks. And that was probably around 11 years old, something like that. And, and I was like, I would literally come home from school and from the time I come in from school, like to the time I have to go to bed, just practice, 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 practice. And then was my cartooning phase. I remember one summer I would spend like the entire day, I mean, 10 hours just drawing, you know, and my friend who wanted to play with me, he was like, Hey, why don't you ever go outside? Like, this is boring. Like he wasn't like a, that kind of obsessive type, but I relate to you there, man. And and when I get when I get it in my head that I want to do something, I have to master it. And I think you're, you're similar in that regard. But, but when you were doing that with hand lettering, like, did you have a plan for what it is that you wanted to get out of that? Or were you just doing it because 
you enjoyed it. It was 100% doing it because I enjoyed it. And the thing that kept me from doing it, I used to actually draw letters in middle school, just doodle on my homework and stuff. And I stopped doing it at some point. And I, I don't know why, but I guess I just believed that I don't know. I don't know where the message came from, but it was like anything you do needs to be something that you can make a living from. Otherwise, it's a waste of your time and you should you should pursue something more serious. And I knew there's no way I can make a living from hand lettering. That's what I told myself. And it wasn't until I met someone who I had followed online who did some great design work. Uh, They were in town. We got some coffee and it was the simplest message. But he just said, Hey, if you enjoy, and he was a great lettering artist. That's why I looked up to him. He said, if you enjoy lettering, just do it. Do it because you enjoy it. And as I say it now, it sounds so silly. Like there's nothing super profound about that, but it was as if he gave me permission. And I I said, yeah, you know what? I do enjoy it. I am just going to do it. And I'm not going to worry about the fact that I, I won't make a living from it. This is just something that fulfills that creative it fills that creative void for me. And, you know, I ended up getting clients. I ended up making a good living, but I was kind of ignoring the elephant in the room. And the, the elephant in the room was I had built up this audience of people, not just who wanted to hire me or buy my shirts or something, but who wanted to do what I was doing. Like they wanted to know how was I making a living as a hand lettering artist? And I was kind of fortunate. Like it, this was luck, but when I looked back at the search trends, those two years where I was showing up every day drawing when nobody cared, it was right in the middle of this resurgent interest in hand lettering. So searches for hand lettering over, uh, I think like a five year period, it went up like uh, a thousand percent. Like it was just, it skyrocketed. I I don't even know why other than like, maybe as things get increasingly digital, we like, we like seeing that there's a human behind the designs that we see. You know, and so that hand lettering brought that. And so a bunch of people were getting into this stuff. So I was getting emails like like a ton, like a dozen emails a day or more from people saying, you know, how do I get started with lettering? What do you do? You know, all this stuff. And so I was responding, responding, responding. And I'm like, I'm answering all the same questions over and over. This is not very efficient. I'm going to put up a 10 step introductory guide on my website. And anytime people email me, I'll just say, hey, go here. And so I was just solving a problem. But what I didn't anticipate was, Google indexed this page and it went to the top for anything like hand lettering or lettering. And over the course of a year, 200,000 people read that guide. And I was like, oh, like there's interest here. You know, I didn't know anything about email marketing. There was no opt in form, it was just a page of valuable information. And so, what's really cool is I thought, hey, there's room to go deeper here. And what I'm noticing is, People don't just need instruction on how to draw, but what they're missing is this whole business aspect. Like, how do you actually work with clients? How do you make money? Is Could you make a living as an artist? You know, what are the things that they didn't teach you at school? And this was all the stuff that I had that I knew. I'd, I'd done it. I'd worked with clients. I'd learned about licensing. I'd written up contracts and I knew how to price. And so I decided I'm going to make a course. I'm going to make a course. And this is at the time where the only other courses out there were like $29 that just taught you how to draw some letters. I came out with this course that was priced around two, $300. And I, I, I spent six months on this. I actually spent six months saving up money to take off six months from client work just so I could build this course. And again, I'm just solving a problem here. If this doesn't do well, I'll just go back to working with clients. No problem. Like, Maybe it helps some people. I didn't really have big expectations for this course, but I spent six months on it. And what I did was I replaced that page that Google had indexed that so much traffic had been coming to with an announcement page, kind of like a press release with cool illustrations and stuff of this course that I was working on. And I said, hey, I'm coming out with this soon. If you want to hear about it, sign up. And by the way, if you sign up, I'll give you my 10 step guide, which was what used to be on the page anyway. And so during these six months, I had built up uh, at the time an email list of 15,000 people who had just signed up on this page. And so when I launched the course, it made six figures in the first three days of launching it. Wow, that's amazing. And it blew me away. Like I, I, did, not, I did not know that was going to happen. But that kind of uh, that showed me what was, what was possible. 
That's amazing. So at, at that point, you had a pretty good following. You, you had your email list. Did you have a social media presence? A little bit, like somewhat of a, a following at that point. But to be honest, a lot of the people that came to, to the email list came from Google at that point, since the page was getting traffic. I, I wanted to ask you one question from before. When you were making money with clients, did you seek out those clients initially, like proactively, or or did they come to you? No, no. And it, in fact, this is uh, this is something that I teach. You know, I have like a, a guide on getting more clients. It's all about attracting clients to you. And this is where not being in scarcity mindset, not being desperate for any work comes uh, to your advantage. When you're not desperate, when you're not chasing the clients and they come to you, it's a totally different dynamic. So again, like I at the time I had the day job income, it's no big deal if I get client work or not. Like I could take it or leave it. And so I was able to be selective. And when I was simply showing my work, showing my process. I was I was doing a bit of blogging at the time and I would share case studies to show work that I'd done with previous clients. It all of that, the content, it attracted clients to me. They wanted me to do work for them. I didn't I didn't have to like beg them or chase them. And so the whole dynamic was changed because if you go to the world famous pizza restaurant and you say, I want your world famous pizza, make it with my sauce, they're gonna kick you out. Because the results require the process. And when you respect and you want those results, look at that case study, look at that portfolio. I want those results for my project. Then you're going to respect the artist's process. And so it's, it's a deferential position. And they come to you and they, they say, Do, you know, basically work your magic, right? It's not like the clients that are micromanaging and tell, nitpicking and change this, change that. It's like, you're the expert. Make me something great. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that with with Think Grow Prosper. Like the ones, the the sponsors and the, and the partners that have that have approached us, those have definitely been the most creatively satisfying, uh, you know, experiences because they're wanting what it is that we have. But I'm, I'm curious if you advocate against like reaching out to clients altogether, or if you just think that that's kind of a, a preferred method to, to have them be attracted to you? Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot more context to it, but I, I will be super blunt and I'll, I'll answer your question. I do recommend against it. I have a, I have a guide with, which has on my website, seanwest.com that has six methods for attracting clients. And the attracting part is very important. If you Chase, I don't, I'm sure you've probably read Robert Cialdini's Influence. Yes. It's a great book. If, if anyone hasn't read it, Influence by Robert Cialdini. It's, yeah, a, really it's, a, it's a classic on, on persuasion. But he talks in that book, among other things, about the rule of reciprocity. And when you give to someone, just it's, a, it's an intrinsic human trait. We feel compelled to give back. That's just how society works. And in a similar sense, when you ask someone it, for the same reason, this rule, it, it, it applies here as well, you kind of owe them. That's just how it works. You know, Han Solo style, I, I owe you one, right? Like, so when you go to a client and you, you're basically saying, will you do me the favor of hiring me? You're leading the relationship with an ask. And so you, you are creating this, uh, this intrinsic pull where you owe them. And so what will happen is you get into this project, say you got the job, sweet. I, I approached this client and they said, yes. What's gonna happen in a lot of cases is you'll get it to a point in the middle of the project where the client wants you to do something that you know is not the best decision, it's not the best choice based on your expertise, but you feel compelled to do it anyway against their, their better interest. And you don't even know why. And you don't know how, how to get out of it and you don't know what's happening. This is exactly why it's happening. It's because you violated the rule of reciprocity. You started the relationship with an ask. Whereas when they come to you, it completely flips the dynamic. I want to take a brief moment to talk about one of our sponsors for this show, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 25,000 classes in pretty much any field you can think of. Writing, photography, uh, cooking, even social media marketing, just to name a few. 
One of the many reasons that I love and promote Skillshare is because their core values of learning and growing are very much in alignment with my own and I'm sure if you're listening to this with yours too. I'll tell you about one of my favorite classes that I've ever taken with Skillshare. It was a productivity masterclass and it was all about creating systems in your life and business. And it was taught by this pretty well-known YouTuber and it completely changed how Vanessa and I run our business. It helped give us our time back by helping us to create systems that streamlined and organized our content creation and our editorial calendar for Finger Girl Prosper. Massively, massively helpful. And here's the cool news. Right now, Skillshare is offering listeners of the Think Girl podcast two months free, so you can try it out for yourself. Go to Skillshare.com slash ThinkGrow. You'll get unlimited access to 25,000 classes for a full two months at no cost. So it's basically a risk-free situation here. The specific URL that you want to visit for this offer is Skillshare.com slash ThinkGrow. Check it out. Join the millions of other students who are learning and growing with Skillshare. I've used it for a while. I love it. I think you will too. Again, that URL is Skillshare.com slash ThinkGrow. And now, back to the show. Take us from this point where you were doing a lot of client work and then you transitioned into creating the course. And this was all centered around hand lettering. And then how did, where's the bridge between that and kind of what you do today? Yeah, great question. So <laughs> that's been a, that's been a five year journey. Um, what I've found in, in doing that, as much as I enjoyed lettering and hand lettering, what lettering was for me in hindsight was something that for the very first time gave me a platform and a voice. It gave me a chance to speak the things I wanted to say. And what kind of set me apart with lettering is I didn't, for the most part, hand letter uh, popular or trite phrases or quotes. Like I took it as an opportunity to share what I felt like was a message I had. And so in almost all cases, I wrote the words and the message that I ended up hand lettering. And yes, I love the art. Again, I, I'm a very creative person, but I'm also pragmatic. And I, I also want to help people. And so a very large part, and I didn't understand this until much later, a very large part of what gave me so much enjoyment and fulfillment from it was imparting the message. And I found later that there are a lot of ways, it was kind of my gateway drug, there's a lot of ways to impart a message. And to just be totally straightforward, it took often four hours to make a very detailed, precise, intricate, hand lettered illustration that had maybe half a dozen words at most. And it's, it's very limiting in terms of like how much of a message you can get out there. And, you know, I've probably spoken something like 15,000 words on this podcast by now. And, and there's, there's just a lot of efficient ways to get a message out there, whether it's video podcast writing. And so I, what I ended up getting addicted to Ruben was I ended up getting addicted to seeing the results people got as as something that they they were able to achieve by following a little bit of guidance that I provided them. And so when I had launched this course, a hand lettered course, there's a lot of people in the world, especially in the marketing world, who would love to make six figures on a course launch in three days. Like they could care less about lettering. They're like, how in the world did you market that? <laughs> and I during those six months, I just... I immersed myself in the world of marketing. I didn't know anything. I just listened to podcasts and watched videos. Like, I mean, 24 seven, I got a Bluetooth speaker in my shower, like no second was spared. I'm just learning, learning, learning. And I just applied everything that I learned. And so all these people were like, how did you do this? And so I started this podcast, the Sean West podcast. We just hit 400 episodes. We've been doing this for uh, five, six years now. And the goal with the podcast was... Yeah, I saw that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. The goal is just to share what I'm learning as I learn it. I like to call it iterating in public. And so we just started this podcast. It's like the intersection of creativity and business. And I was getting feedback from people all across the world saying, the show's changed my life. I've been able to quit my job. I've been able to start start my business and move across the world. And like they're in all kinds of different industries. Some of them were doctors or lawyers or real estate or 
you know, developers or filmmakers, photographers, like it wasn't just hand lettering artists. And so I started seeing like, wow, like this principled way that I'm approaching my business is helping people in a lot of different industries. And so at that point, as much as I loved drawing letters, what fulfilled me even more was helping people get unstuck, helping people pursue what they're passionate about and learn how to actually make a living from it. Is that around the time when you started writing Overlap, which is the, the, your, your book? Yeah, Overlap was kind of four years in the making because I started out, I wrote 20,000 words and then I scrapped it all because I realized I was writing the book I wanted to write and not the book people needed to read. So I just went back to the drawing board and I spent the next three years just talking to people in person, conferences, meetups, networking events, and trying to figure out, like, here I was just writing this practical business book, but meanwhile, people, they're stuck. They're like, I come home from my day job and I have no energy. Or, or they say, I don't know what I'm passionate about. And other people say, I have too many passions. I have so many passions, I don't know which way to go. They feel like they're spinning around in their office chair, chair you know, 360 degrees, which is the right direction. And, and yet other people are saying, my family doesn't support me or my spouse doesn't believe in me. Like there, there were all these real problems that were keeping people stuck that didn't even have to do with the business stuff. And so after uh, something like 300 conversations over several years, I learned a lot more about what keeps people stuck. And so I went back to writing the book and I, I wrote it in such a way that first it helps people get unstuck and then it gives them the practical business advice of like, how do you make money and build up income streams? And that's kind of been your work since, since then. And that's kind of what you do with the podcast. And, and that's kind of what you do with the products you produce now. That's it. That brings us to the current day. And that's what I focus on with, you know, different shows and, and you know, content and stuff. But uh, mainly what I do on a day to day basis is run our um our, our community. We have a business community for creative professionals at seanwest.com. And that's, that's what I love doing. Like I'm creating content on the front end, but I, I decided, you know, I made all these courses, Ruben, like, we, you know, have made 300, 400, 500, $600,000 a year. I like got to the point of eight full-time employees actually scaled all the way back down to just me in the past year. It's been like a really insane journey. But what I found is you know, after all the course stuff, like I really don't want to be in the business of selling information. I want to be in the business of transformation. And so I, I made all the courses that like, there was like $2,500 courses. There was thousand dollar courses. I just put them all in our membership. And I said, Hey, anyone who's a member, you get those for free. I just want to, I want to be here and help you implement like, and so I spend a lot of my day in our community just going back and forth with people, helping them apply things in their life, in their unique situation. That's amazing, man. That's, that's a really cool model. And, um, one that I, I definitely have thought about, like gravitated toward, it seems much more, it just seems much more efficient and much more contained and, and a little bit more streamlined, which kind of brings me to my, the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which maybe you can help me with this since you're so good at helping people. But this is something that I've noticed that you're very good at, which is building systems and, and making, essentially making your life easier through systems. And you're a very organized person. In a nutshell, what I've learned is like, I cannot schedule, um, I cannot schedule the outcome of what I want. I have to schedule the process. I have to schedule the micro actions. Like, I used to schedule, oh, podcasts on Thursdays. And th then Thursday would come and I'd get my notification in my calendar and I wouldn't have anything done. So now I'm scheduling like the micro steps needed to make the podcast, right? Like reach out to guests, schedule that. Um, like respond to guest invite, schedule that. Record episodes, schedule that. Like, and so it's now it's deconstructed in a way that is much more useful and much more actionable for me. That, that's one way we've kind of like just, and it seems like a very obvious way now that I'm talking about it, but that, that's one way that we've um, streamlined our life and business is basically deconstructing these tasks into, into micro steps and then scheduling the micro steps. Um, so anyway, what are your thoughts on that to begin with? 
I could talk all day about processes. I love it. <laughs> Honestly, I think you've got it down. You've got it figured out. As an example, when I record a podcast, what I don't do and have done in the past is schedule a block that says record the podcast because there's a lot more to it. You know, you've got to write an outline beforehand. And so I've learned since I have a, a block on my calendar for writing the outline. I have a block afterward for editing the podcast. You you do have to break it down like you're saying and get granular. I am a chronic procrastinator. Like I would get a three week paper in school and I'd wait until the night before, literally the night before. And I would work all night and I'd get like a 78 and pass and, you know, it was terrible. Or with piano lessons, you know, my my teacher, I don't know how she knew, but somehow she knew. I would cram in the practice that I was supposed to do every day. And she would say, Sean, you played beautifully, but you would do even better if you practiced every day. I'm like, how did you know? <laughs> you know, she knew somehow. <laughs> yeah. But I'm I'm a chronic procrastinator. And so for me, the processes and the systems are purely survival. Because if I did not have them, nothing would get done. I, I would just wait until the last minute all of the time. The only reason I don't have time to record the podcast every week, but how, somehow we're 400 episodes in. The only reason I do it is because it's scheduled and people expect it and people are going to show up. And, you know, it's I, what I what I do is I get my back against the wall. I've just found for me, when I get my back against the wall, that's when I perform. And if you think of it, if you're a procrastinator like me, you're probably the same way. There are certain things that you eventually reach this threshold where you care more about getting the thing done than the ramifications of not getting the thing done, whether that's reputation or money or whatever, right? Like at some point you're like, oh, I have to do this because if I don't, the ramifications are bad. And, and for me, like, I don't know any way other than operating like that. And so I, I simply, I simply leverage that. I get my back against the wall to where I have to perform. Like I actually schedule things. And so I, I almost schedule what seems at first like a little too much. But what I find is I actually waste so much time. I started tracking my time a few years ago. Uh, and you can you can do it easily on modern phones today, but you install like rescue time or other time, time trackers on your computer. You can see exactly where your time goes, how much time you spend on Twitter, how much time you spend watching YouTube videos or on your phone. If it's Instagram, you know, you're like, wow, I waste a lot of time and I'm I'm really productive, but I waste a lot of time. And so when I schedule things and I actually schedule a little bit more like just slightly make myself uncomfortable. What it does is it it forces me to remove the time wasters and just get things done, get my back against the wall. That is super useful. Like you just recognize, you re, you just kind of work with your your temperament and your natural proclivities as opposed to trying to fight them. I think that's an important. <laughs> An important thing to recognize. Yeah, I mean, we we procrastinate because we have the luxury to. <laughs> right. I want to ask you. I, I'm kind of struggling to to decide what direction to take this because I, I do want to get into like the details of how you create systems and things. So feel free to answer in whatever way you see fit. But how? I know you have a really interesting way of going about your editorial calendar and a really simple way that you can do it kind of like, you know, very like on the fly almost. Can you kind of talk about that? Like if, if for the content creators out there, the people who are putting stuff out on the internet, um, which is increasing every single day, um, like you need to have an editorial calendar. Can you talk about what an editorial calendar is and how you go about creating it? Yeah, so an editorial calendar is very complicated. It costs twenty nine dollars a month. No, I'm kidding. It, it, can, <laughs> it can be super basic. All it means is you know what you're going to post before you post it. Kind of, kind of basic, but you know, surprisingly, we don't do it. We just scramble at the last moment. Oh no, I need to send a newsletter. I need to post a blog post. I haven't put anything on Instagram. You know, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, I, I I know because I've been there. So uh, I had to create systems out of survival. And that's all an editorial calendar is. I'm going to tell you how I make an editorial calendar on my phone using the built-in notes app. Very simple. And so the, the 
case study here would be quote graphics for Instagram posts. Let's take a post on Instagram. What is it comprised of? Well, okay. So I like to post quote graphics with something that I've written. So we've got the thing that I've written, whatever that message is. We have the graphic that needs to be made. In my case, I do it in Photoshop. There's a lot of apps you can use these days, uh, but I make it in Photoshop. So then we have a resulting image. For me, it's a PNG. Usually I'm making this on my computer. Sometimes it might be on my phone. What else do we have? Well, we have when is this going to be posted? On what day? And finally, we have the description. And this is this is a underutilized real estate. You should essentially treat the description of your Instagram posts as a micro blog. Don't neglect this. This is the, the difference between uh, having a depth of connection and engagement with your followers and just a surface level relationship. So share more details and context and thoughts in your descriptions. You can go up to 2,200 characters. I know because I looked it up because I wanted to put more, but you have that much room. Use it up because people will read it. Well, Sean, I don't do that. I scroll through super fast and I just, I barely double tap. That's fine. But the super engaged people, your super fans, they will read it and you want to deepen your connection with them. Just as an aside, you've had some captions that are, have blown my mind, kind of life-changing captions. So definitely there are people who read your captions and who will read the long caption. So I just wanted to say that. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. And uh, here's just another tip. If you go to the the trouble of, and I, I'm, I'm just really kind of dialing this in lately. I feel like I've kind of gotten to a groove. If you go to the trouble, I say, to write a description, a lengthy description, you can repurpose that. Like you could, you could use that as a script or an outline for a video. You can post a blog post on your website, which I do with the quote graphic. And we are going to get into the editorial calendar. I, I then post the quote graphic on Twitter with a tweet storm, which Twitter makes very easily, makes very easy to do now. You can just chain the tweets together. I post it on LinkedIn. I post it on Facebook automatically from Instagram. Like it's, it's great. You know, then you can pin the quote graphic on your blog post from your website on Pinterest. It's amazing. Like it, it all just turns into tons of pieces of content from one effort, but you've got to get these pieces and you've got to get, get it into uh, a folder. So here's what I do. I have the notes app on my phone. I have it um, upload iCloud so it goes on my Mac. But all of this, if you're if you're creative, if you you know don't use iCloud, don't have an iPhone, like you can use different Notes app. You can be creative. You can use different syncing services, Dropbox, Google, all that. So just keep an open mind here. But I'll just tell you what I do. I use the Notes app. I have a an iCloud folder in the Notes app called Instagram. What I do is while I'm on my computer, because that's where I create my quote graphics, I create a new document in this Instagram folder in the notes app. The document starts out with a date. So we're gonna pick tomorrow's date and you just put the date right there. Then I hit the return carriage twice and I put the description of the post, my, my written description. Then here's the really cool part and why I like the notes app and iCloud and all that. I can simply drag the PNG graphic into this note. And I don't know if people know this, but like the notes are actually rich media, you can drag images in and it'll just sync it right to your phone. And so when you have time, and when I say have time, you've got to make the time, you've got to set it aside, schedule it. When are you going to work on this? Spend two hours on a Saturday, you know, or do it in the evening on Tuesday, figure out the time when you're going to do this. And don't just create one post, create three. Batch process. Right. Yeah. The, the batching content has been another huge shift in um, in our behavior that we've done it's like batching content is kind of the key to having a life otherwise you're just continually making content and you know what i mean like and fitness people will tell you the same thing with meal prep it's like if you're going to cook one chicken breast like why not cook 10 chicken breasts at the same time it takes no more effort obviously when you're creating content it's a little bit more effort but it's it's the same principle totally right it's the difference between having a life and not. So you're going to create a document. It'll have the date. You drag the image in and you write the description. That's ready to go. And so you wake up, you look in there, you say, where's today's date? There's today's date. I'm going to post this. So if you're just starting out, what I recommend is a weekly output. Just start with weekly. 
daily is awesome. Daily is the ultimate. You're going to stay top of mind with people, but don't start there because it's going to be too much. Start with weekly. And here's the minimum. This is what I want you to have in your buffer. This is your editorial calendar queue of content. Start with four to six pieces of content, 100% ready with the description, with the graphic, everything. It's 100% ready to go. Keep a minimum of four to six pieces of content in your queue. Then you've got a trip, you got a conference, you're good to go. You've made that in advance. And if you deplete that buffer a little bit, it's okay. You've got four weeks, you got six weeks to make it back up. And once you've been consistent with that for, let's say, several months, then you might start to think about increasing the frequency. Could I go twice a week? Could I go three times? Could I go up to, you know, maybe even daily? But do that gradually. For daily, I recommend 10 to 14 pieces of content ready to go. And I'm speaking to myself because I'm bad about it (laughs) and I still scramble. But man, is life not great when I have it? So the way we've kind of approached it is, I I think, pretty similar in principle. But we we batch the the waterfall content, you know, the podcast and the blog, basically, because if, if, if you create a podcast, you can create a bunch of different other pieces of content from that, which is what I mean by waterfall content. That's exactly what I'm doing right now, actually. Like people are listening to this as a podcast. They don't even know. I, I'm filming myself record this podcast <laughs> just because I like I record all my conversations because it can turn into content. And I, I either have I have, you know, plenty of video here that I can clip into different things. I have audio that I can drop into a transcription app that I use. And now I've got text. Every single word I've said, I have text of, or I will soon. I can turn that into newsletters. I can, I can look at that for inspiration for future posts. It's huge. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a total game changer because you can just focus on the macro content, the waterfall content. And then from that, like you schedule that, okay? You schedule that. And then from that, like I'll write a, let's say I write a blog post and it's a, you know, 800 word blog post. And then I will extract from that maybe a couple, two or three different like lines that I really liked and then turn that into an Instagram uh, quote graphic. And then bada bing, bada boom. And then, you know, I'll, and then I'll, but the thing, the key is for, for me at least so far has been writing, taking one or two days, maybe three days to write four or five blog posts and then taking another three or four, you know, taking another day rather, and then just making all the Instagram content. So that by the end of the week, it's like, oh, you have your waterfall content and then you have all the content you're going to use to promote that waterfall content. And so it's, it turns into a, a very cool little, self-perpetuating system. I'm just nodding along as you're <laughs> saying all of this, like 100%. And if, if people aren't picking up on the theme, it all starts with writing. Writing is the biggest thing because it can turn into every other format. You can turn it into graphics. You can read it and it's it's audio. It's a podcast. You could film yourself reading it and it's a video. You know, it, you can turn it into a speech or a book. Like it's it's, it, it can turn into anything. So I, I think the biggest thing you can do is just for your career and your life is build a writing habit. I don't even think of myself as a writer, yet I write a million words a year. And it's like, whoa, that's, that's a lot of words, Sean. But if you do the math, it's 2,740 words a day. Like it's, it's not even that much. You know, I used to start with a thousand. I I used to recommend, Hey, just try to get to a thousand words a day. And then the problem with that advice is some people they're super driven. They're super motivated. They like numbers and goals and they would, they would do that and it would work for them. And I was one of those people, but I found in teaching people how to write and build a writing habit. A lot of other people struggle with that because they, they would say, Oh, Sean, I wrote 870 words today and I'm just, I'm a failure. So I, you know, I basically went four more days without writing until I knew that I could write a thousand words. And I'm like, no, that's not the point. The point was just to write every day. It's not about the numbers. Yeah, I could see myself doing that for sure. So I wanted to ask you about that also, actually, your your writing, because you are, you are a very consistent writer and very prolific writer, apparently. But I wanted to ask you, so you you write like, what is 2,700 words a day? On average, I mean, sometimes it's 1,500, sometimes it's 5,000, but, you know, I, more or less I write some thousands of words a day. 
Is that all stuff that that you share or intend to share at some point, or is that some of that just like chicken scratch that you're kind of getting like your stream of consciousness going and and things like that? It's both. So uh, depending on the season, I've been in seasons of my life where literally everything I wrote was going out and and often it was in the form of courses or books. Um, And then I've gone through seasons where I was exclusively focusing on journaling and then just writing, you know, some things publicly. The season I'm in right now is I start each day with a brain dump. I call it stream of consciousness writing, which is essentially a journal. I write every single thought I'm thinking, just what happened in the day, how I'm feeling, you know, and it's just to get the fingers moving to strengthen the connection between my mind and my fingers. And this is part of your, your, your this is part of your, um, this counts toward your writing quota for the day. Yes. I spent about 20 minutes uh, max, sometimes like even less on the journaling. And then I end up spending a few hours uh, writing for other stuff. But I recommend people just start with 20 minutes. But but honestly, when I do journal that much, usually my word count is much more like three, four, five thousand. 5,000. But I, I'm usually writing a few thousand words for like email newsletters, for blog posts, for courses, for uh, presentations or talks, or in a lot of cases, it's like very detailed responses to the members in my community, you know, just helping them with their problems and stuff or preparing for interviews and, you know, doing different shows and stuff. So I've found that writing is just where everything, no matter what I want to do, if I'm like, I need to make a video about this, right? Oh, someone wants me to speak, right? You know, so I optimize my day around writing. Like I, I'm a night owl at heart, you know, again, oldest of 13 kids, never a dull moment, super crazy at home. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say crazy. They were actually really well behaved, but it was <laughs> loud. <laughs> and I love my silence, right? So like when I got married, I would stay up super late because I was it was just a habit. Like I was running a business even when I lived at home with my family and I would work at like 2 a.m. because that's when it was quiet. Problem was my wife was having to open the coffee shop at four something a.m. that she worked at and I was like, do I stay up and say bye to her? Or And it was like, it, this is bad for marriage. And so I was like, okay, you know what? Everyone's saying, wake up early, wake up early. That's how you be successful. I'm like, I don't, I would Google like and find articles that said what I already believed just to make myself feel better. But it, finally, the, the, the data side of me took over. The scientist, you know, I was like, all right, I need to prove to myself. I'm going to write instead of at night, when is, which is when I would do things. I'm going to wake up early and write as the first thing and I'm going to log my output for three weeks. Just I want to just prove that it doesn't matter when you do this. And much to my surprise, I doubled my output by writing first thing in the morning. So I've never looked back. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and it definitely is helpful to kind of like be on the same schedule as the rest of the world. Cause I mean, I'm like you, like I, I really do, I could stay up late and I could like be a night owl and, and write and, and I have. Um, it's, it's when I feel really creative, but, but both ends of the day work for that. You know, um, I, any time when like the world is asleep, I feel, I feel very creative when the world is asleep and I I feel like I can think better, you know? And even when I'm in a group of people, like I, I, I don't think quite as well as when I'm alone. And so, I mean, I think that's probably a result of, of being an introvert, but that is a useful thing to recognize that, yo, you can achieve the same results as a night owl if you get up early and you can also be a functioning human being. Well, I mean, more specifically, and again, I, I don't try to convince people to, to wake up early because I know I can't. I know they'll, they'll find things that confirm their bias that say you can succeed as a night owl. I just say, prove it to yourself because I surprised myself. I found that my output doubled when I wrote the same amount of time but in the morning, instead of at the end of the day after I'd accumulated all this mental baggage, my output was better and that's what the data showed. So I just say, hey, perform an experiment and show yourself when you are most productive. Yeah, that's useful. Man, I know we're, we're coming close on time here. Um, so I, I want to I wanna wind down. But you've given a lot of really, really good tips to structure your day, tips to, you know, approach your work. And I think we're going to, we're going to find that really useful. I just have some random questions, like just because you have an interesting background and you have a couple more minutes. Oh yeah. I I love random questions. 
Okay, cool. So kind of non sequitur, but what I've heard you on on a podcast. I think one of your podcasts. You kind of do an activity in order to, and, and then once you get in the top ten percent, you kind of stop. I, I feel a, a similar kind of a way. But you said you're you're kind of in the top ten percent of writing, and then you also alluded to the fact that you play music in this conversation. But I heard you say that you're in the top ten percent of musicians, or maybe. 11, 12 percent you've said, but what, what, what instruments do you play? And can you talk a little bit more about like, um, your experience as a musician? Yeah. So uh, uh, it's funny you mentioned that I, I kind of got that vibe that you were similar and I almost brought it up earlier, but it, yeah, you're obviously paying close attention. Um, so I'm not actually like claiming to be in the top 10 percent. I, I mean, maybe, maybe there are people who write, you know, many millions of words each year and there's enough of them to be in the top 10 percent and i'm i'm less i don't really know like it's just kind of a a mental thing i'm just saying from my perspective it's a heuristic it's kind of a rough thing exactly yeah i'm just for some reason i i like to attain what i would just i would say is like kind of dipping my toe in mastery in a field like getting to the point where it's like i, I think i've reached like the upper echelon of this field and then I don't know why, I don't know what it is, but for some reason, then I lose interest. I could, you know, it, it's the point of diminishing returns. That's what it is. It's like, I could spend the next 20 years closing the gap, you know, increasing 91%, 92%. And then you just, you get into the elite athletes of whatever the field is. And it's, it's just diminishing returns. But I feel like I can get there to just the start of that much quicker. But then for some reason, I lose interest and I go obsess about something else you know i don't i don't know what that is i so for musical instruments i play piano and guitar uh, sometimes i would play in the same song which was a lot of fun but i'm not as proficient with guitar because i learned that much later in life i think i was 15 years old but i started playing piano at like five and so i'm much better at piano i enjoy piano but honestly i've consciously set it aside and I don't know exactly what to think about that, but like my my thought process, my reasoning is I'm okay with embracing the seasonal nature of life. Like we're all in different seasons. You've you were in a season before. It could be a job, it could be a place you lived, and you know, a relationship. Like things things change, you know, passions change, hobbies change, vocations change. And I, I I'm okay with saying no to something now so that I can say yes to it in in a better time. And I feel like right now is my business season. Like I had my I had my artist season. I feel like now is the business season and so I'm I'm being somewhat strategic in that I love music. I would love to play music and create music and I certainly believe now after having done well with something as obscure as hand lettering that there's no doubt I could make a living as a musician. But I know that's the furthest thing from easy. And with the momentum I have right now, it's very easy to make a living, relatively speaking, after many years in business, like running business. And I figure if I can get to a place where I'm very financially stable, then, you know, I'm only 30 years old, then I can spend years in the future producing music, whether like I like producing electronic music or playing piano Um you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of saying I'm okay with that being a later season, like re reintroducing that. That, that reminded me of something that is also slightly unrelated, but the season thing that you mentioned, the sabbatical, the sabbaticals that you take, you've worked those into. Oh, Ruben, you're going to bring it in. <laughs> I know. I wanted to bring that in. I know we're, we're, we're running, we're running. If you have to go, don't worry. But but I, I wanted to to see if you could kind of like just touch on that because I think the work life balance thing is a really key thing. And some people are like, oh, you just you just have to you have to work. There is no work life balance, you know. I've got the nutshell version. Okay, man. And this was a tough one too because like we've covered a lot today. When I wrote my first book, Overlap, it was actually really difficult to completely omit the sabbaticals thing. Because I'm like, there's too much here. This needs to be the next book. <laughs> so it is my mission by the year 2047 to get every company in the world to pay their employees to take off every seventh week as a sabbatical. That is my mission. 
Now, the context behind that and how we got there is I am a recovered workaholic. I, for 10 years, most of my 20s, worked 16 to 18 hour days, seven days a week. And I love my work. You know, I really do. But I I realize like <laughs> there's a difference between simply loving something and like we've said, being obsessed. And, you know, th- there is a good side to obsession. I do think there is truly something productive. There can be something about uh, productive obsession directed in the right way, like healthily. But my speaking of health, I completely neglected my health. I would I I wasn't exercising, moving. I would I'm just being totally honest here. There were days there were times where I didn't leave the house for 8 days. Like it was it was bad. <laughs> and so like my physical health was bad. I wasn't exercising let alone standing. I didn't have a standing desk. You know, none of that stuff. My relationships you know, with, with friends were practically non-existent. At one point I realized every person I called friend was someone I paid except for my wife. And then I realized, wait, no, I pay my wife too. She's on payroll. I'm like, Oh no, what is happening here? Like what? Oh my goodness. Like I, I was, I was consumed by it. And I knew like, I'm, I'm so obsessive. I have this on or off personality I I don't know how to be anything other than obsessed. And so I was like, if I'm all in on whatever I do, what does it look like to go all in on a break? Because I can't keep doing this. I'm going to burn out bad. It's going to be very, very bad. And so I was researching this and I came across this this TED talk by uh, Stefan Sagmeister about this sabbatical year where his, his agency, his firm would take off every seventh year. And he had this story about it and it was so great. And I was so inspired. I'm like, this is, this is amazing, but I can't, I can't wait to take off a whole year. Like I need something now. I need something sooner. I need a small scale sabbatical. And so as a sort of play on numbers, you know, he, he proposed the seventh year sabbatical. There's seven days in a week. I was like, what if I take off every seventh week as a sabbatical? And so I just started writing about this podcasting, telling people in my audience, I think I'm going to do this. This was five years ago. I think I'm going to try this. And it came time to take the first sabbatical. And I probably wouldn't have done it had I not told people that I was going to do it. I kind (laughs) of made myself accountable. And it sounds sad, but the second sabbatical, you know, the first one feels like a vacation. We all know what that feels like. But then (sighs) six weeks passed and it, it was time to take off another week. I'm like, I can't do that. I can't. There's too much work to be done. Like, look at all this work. I can't take off a week. I don't have time for a sabbatical. But I told people it was like this, this TV show, you know, tune in next to see what this workaholic (laughs) does on his next sabbatical. Like, I have to do it. And so it sounds sad, but I had to just grit my teeth and like take off a week, you know? Yeah, yeah. But the third sabbatical, that's where it clicked. That's where it was like my body was craving it. And it was like, it was starting to accept the rhythm of like, man, I still worked hard. I, I still invest in myself, but I, I was all in and then I was all off. Like I was fully committed to the break. Like no, this is my sabbatical. Look at the calendar. You know, speaking of systems and processes, it's as simple as I created an event on my Google calendar called sabbatical and just said repeat every seven weeks and I haven't touched it. I haven't changed it. And so if I had to think of it each time, like, hmm, do I want to take a sabbatical? I wouldn't do it. The only reason I do is because it's automated. And I look at the calendar and it says, hey, you're taking a sabbatical next week, like it or not. And I go, oh, all right. I love that. I th- that I relate to that, and and I call my I, I tell my wife that I'm kind of like a robot. Like if I see something scheduled, like I'm just have to do it. Like there, it's just kind of a it's just a thing. Like I have no choice in the matter. And so I think that's kind of the theme of this conversation in terms of scheduling and systematizing. Like schedule it, just do it, treat it like a business. Even if even if that part of the business is taking off the business, you know. So um, I think that's really useful. If I can give people a little bit of a before and after. So you heard that it was 16, 18 hour days, seven days a week, not exercising, not moving, not spending time building relationships. I would sleep five, maybe six hours a night. 
and I told myself I felt I felt great. You know, I don't like when I sleep longer, and I've I've learned better since then. But this is this is the before and after. After taking sabbaticals for you know four or five years now, I I pay my employees to take off every seventh week. In the year 2020, it's my first. I actually came back around full circle to my original inspiration and said, you know what, I am also going to take the seventh year sabbatical. And so in 2020, I'm taking off the entire year and I'm I'm just going to, I don't, there's no agenda. There's no agenda. And, and for some years, it really, really scared me. And in the past couple, like I've come around to, I am so excited for this. I'm so excited for the question mark on the year 2020 calendar of possibility. And just to give you a before and after, like now I sleep eight hours a night. I take off all major holidays. I take off every seventh week as the sabbatical. I exercise 90 to 120 minutes per day. I work five days a week and take off weekends. I work no more than eight hours per day, often less. And I spend 30 minutes every day just with my wife talking with her. Like, and, and that's not like, oh, you only spend 30 minutes with her a day. It's like, no, I spend more time with her, but we have a dedicated 30 minutes. Like, like, well, it, we used to sit down. Now we actually take a walk, two birds with one stone, but we call it a mini date. And like my life is just so completely different. It has been the most incredible thing. And, and I truly believe that this is, this is a revolutionary concept. I think we are all chronically burnt out at a low level and we're just pushing through it. And I think this can be a competitive advantage for companies. When you're looking at two agencies that are otherwise equal and one of them pays their employees to take off every seventh week, you know they're happier people and happier people do better work. And what we found is it's not like we get less done. People would say like, oh, that's nice. You take off every seventh week, like maybe you don't get as much done, but at least you're more rested. And I say, no, no, we get more done because things take as long as the amount of time you give them. So we take seven weeks worth of work and we say, how do we get this done in six weeks? And we get it done every single time. And then we rest, we come back and there's a spike in productivity that results in a net win because we're just charged up. Like when's the last time you came to a Monday and you're like, yeah, let's go, man. <laughs> you're like, that's how I feel. Well, I'm excited to talk with you uh, in the year 2020 next next year and see see how it's going for you. Maybe we'll do another another round, um, maybe before then, but maybe then. And I, I'm curious to see how how that pans out um, for you. Well, it's it's wide open. You know, the possibilities are endless. But I, <laughs> I I I decided to. My next book is called Seventh Week Sabbatical, and I decided to write this book in public. Because if I got hit by a bus and it never went out, that would really suck. So I was like, I'm just going to write this as I go. And so I got a, a, this is not even like my main business. Like you're going to go here and it's like, it's like, what is this? How is he making money? For, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, this is like, like what, what blogs used to feel like in 2004. Sabbatical.blog is the website I got. And so if you go to sabbatical.blog, you'll basically get to watch me write my, you'll be able to read my book as I write it. That's awesome. What a cool project. Sean, um, I will put all the other relevant links that you've mentioned here and, and not mentioned here in the show notes. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over on time, so I want to thank you so much for sharing all that you shared with us. It's been, it's been an awesome talk, man. And you've been super gracious, Ruben. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for listening. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Of course. Hopefully we can do it again. Hey, thanks for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode and all other episodes on my website at thinkgrowprosper.com slash podcast. That's where I put all the links and resources mentioned in each episode. It's also where I put the outlines of topics covered, which is a really good way to refer back to episodes in the future. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, I'd love to hear about it. Feel free to leave a review on iTunes with your biggest takeaway. I make it a point to read all the reviews. You can also screenshot this episode and share it to your social media along with something you learned or found interesting and tag me in your post because I'd love to see what you found interesting. Say hi and thank you for your support.